Well, I'm gonna give it a shot. I don't know. I think I found where it might be playing on the uh, Fox 31 site. So, you know, giving it a whirl. <laughs> That's good news. You know, we've been talking about it for two days. But uh, yeah, so the. Uh, hopefully it'll show up. Who knows? Who knows? Uh, it looks like it's going to. Yeah, see, right on this Fox 31, it's a cold case solved, and then there's a little today at 9:30 with a with a a little video camera thing next to it. It says watch live. But then it also has you, you can click on a link. I don't know what that means, but <laughs> it's looking, it looks. It looks mildly promising. But yes, uh, Peggy Beck is the woman, or she was only 16 at the time. She was in Colorado. Uh, de you know, in a, at a uh, Girl Scout camp and was murdered in her tent and her tent mate was sick. So for me, I mean, it just feels like it, somebody that knew that situation that the, the, her tent mate was sick and in the infirmary and not in the tent. But I guess we'll see. That's probably going to be somebody that they looked at. If it's some random person, man, how crazy is that? But she was strangled and she put up a fight, scraped, uh, scratched the guy, and uh, got his skin under her fingernails. This is 1963, and they stored it. In 2007, they submitted... Hey, thanks, Rochelle. They submitted the DNA in 2007 and it was really crazy for those of you who missed it but yesterday during uh, a live premiere that we were doing uh, Gritty Gret said oh yeah they did DNA testing 2007 I said oh really and I just went off to the side did a Google search and then in 35 minutes prior it, it a post on Google you know Google a story was uploaded that the case was solved I mean it was absolutely crazy because we covered it the night before I mean, the odds of that are astronomical, but uh, unbelievable. So hopefully this plays here. If you guys can find a link to let me know that this looks like this is supposed to be playing here. It said, watch live, cold case solved. But it has a link there, but then it also has this red. Does that mean it's going to? Yeah. Okay. Tune in to watch live. But there's a. So hopefully they mean right here. Well, thanks, Wanda. It's amazing, though, uh, how the, you know, I, my viewership you know, views per video have gone way down, yet some of these clowns that just cover the same case over and over get tens of thousands. Quantity, or quality versus quantity, I guess. Yeah, but isn't this going to be a link right here, too? Pandemic has put him on the streets. You know, we yeah. know that a lot of people are. Yeah, I mean, it's hard enough. It's going to, you know, I've got other live feeds, too. I had that same live feed that you just sent me. OK, so you think it'll be played on the. Uh... Cruise, okay. and he says he was in a job training program, uh, but that temporarily. Yeah, lasted. I don't know. We'll see, though. Hopefully it's going to play here in four minutes. Uh, but has yet to get back uh, any offers 
kind of going to be tough right now because those businesses uh, are going to be remaining closed for some time. And he tells us, you know, this has been his first time truly experiencing homelessness. I stayed at a hostel as long as I could, um, you know, looking for a job until it ran out. And then I had to go to the shelter. Um, and then they, they, have, they had this program called the Next Step Program. Uh, that would help you, you know, yeah, guess we'll see what happens to help you get on your way, you know. So work-wise, um, jobs just are, are they stopped hiring altogether. They're just not hiring until they see how this pans out. Cruz also says that what makes things tough is that if you don't have a lot of data on your phone, you can't pay for that. Uh, it'll be hard to keep track of all the applications you're putting out there. On top of that, you know, a library Wait, resource this, right generally there? where people can turn to. Uh, they're okay, closed at this I'm time, too. And he says... I'm going to turn down this. Like him who are staying here right now. We're now reporting in Not Denver. Sure I'm Jacqueline Quinn, CBSN, Denver. Well, with a number of people unemployed in Colorado growing, we are looking out for who's hiring. And this looks like it's going to play there. That's why on Wednesday we brought you a free job seeking seminar right here on CBSN Denver. Here's our Joel Hillen. There's layoffs and unemployment is skyrocketing and it's just such a surreal place that we all find ourselves in right now. Career coach Andrew Hudson has been holding a series of job seminars hosted by C Okay, well, it looks like it's going to play here in 2 minutes and 11 seconds. I'll keep this their other resume link to open the position. Don't say case. I have deep experience in aerospace and law if you're not applying for a job in aer Yeah. And uh, this, this is the case, so I'll read it to you real quick. Her broken fingernails indicated to investigators that teenage Girl Scout camp counselor Margaret Beck desperately fought, for, fought her attacker. The FBI collected scrapings from her fingernails after her 16-year-old body was found in her sleeping bag on August 18, 1963 at a girls' camp in the Pike National Forest. That evidence, collected 44 years ago, could not lead to her killer, according to cold case investigator Cheryl Moore of the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office. Anyways, they submitted DNA in 2007, uh, didn't lead to anything, but then they resubmitted that, or, re, you know, did the genealogy in 2019, and it's, uh, the investigation into that has led to the, the identity And it should be starting here pretty soon. And you might hear my dogs bark or anything because <laughs> they do it anyways, but this is kind of early in the morning and they're just getting up. Okay, does something just show up magically here? Okay, should start soon. We are unable to to do this time. Hmm. Okay, well, I don't know what they're saying, but oh, that was actually a no message right to the the police to the sheriff's department's Facebook page. Looks like something's going to happen here. I'm watching both screens. <laughs> See which one's going to have it. Oh, this one might have it. case, 16-year-old Peggy Beck was murdered back in 1963. Investigators say this case has been solved. Let's listen in to their news conference. 
Dr. Elias Alberti to speak about this, and then also Denver's former district attorney, Mitch Morrissey, who is with United Data Connect, um, <clears throat> to also talk about the process of genealogical DNA and uh, the importance that it has um, in resolving cases like this. Um, and this is the second time we've had I need to turn it up, this right? type of method. Um, <clears throat> but uh, to open this up, my name is Jeff Schrader. I'm the Jefferson County Sheriff. It's S-H-R-A-D-E-R. -E Currently, we have 48 open cold cases, including this case that we're going to talk about today. Um, 37 of those are homicides, two are unidentified remains, and the, and the balance of those are missing persons cases where there may be homicides or deaths. Um, we are committed here to resolving all of these to the very extent that we can um, and to bring closure to the families. Um, and then also, where applicable, to hold suspects accountable for their crimes. Margaret Beck, or Peggy as she was known to her family, lived with her parents and her three sisters in Edgewater. She was the oldest of four girls. She loved riding her bike to different destinations, maybe the local pool or the library, and sometimes to school where she was a student at North High School. Peggy joined the Girl Scouts when she was nine years old. At the age of 16, she was very excited when she got the opportunity to go to the Mile High Girl Scout Counselors Camp because it was the first time that she was going as a counselor. It was on Sunday, August 18th of 1963 that Peggy was found dead by her tent mate at that Girl Scout camp. It was later that day when Peggy's family returned home from church that they learned what happened to Peggy. This homicide investigation um, was initially extensive um, and included efforts by a newly um, appointed sheriff at that time, Harold Bray, who was involved in the case, as well as other investigators and staff from the sheriff's office at the time. Obviously, things were much different in Jefferson County and the sheriff's office back in 1963. Um, and these things required all hands on deck to include the sheriff. Moving forward, after this case became cold and suspects weren't able to identify, um, there were renewed efforts by our investigation staff, Investigator Alberti and a number of other people, people from the Jefferson County Regional Crime Lab, and I'd like to acknowledge Beth Hewitt, who did the DNA work on this case, um, and many others that are associated with it, and then also United Data Connect and the special work that Joan Handlin of that organization does. That public-private partnership has uh, helped us in the process and in the identification of a suspect in this case, and I'm going to ask Investigator Alberti to talk more about that detail. United but Data Connect, an arrest like warrant Parabon. was applied for and obtained for James Raymond Taylor, date of birth, December 22nd of 1939. We have not been able to locate him. Um, and uh, again, I Investigator Alberti would, will be talking about more details of that here in just a couple of moments. But I wanna bring this focus back to the people who survive Peggy. Um, this is the reason we do this work. Her three sisters are alive, and this is a painful time for them uh, to have this, this wound reopened, um, and, and, uh, and, and, and we acknowledge that. And our sympathies um, on behalf of the entire Sheriff's Office go out to them. The statement from the family that they provided to us was, Peggy was a beautiful young girl who loved life. She was loving and protective of her family, and we will cherish the memories we have of her forever. And we would like to thank the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office investigative team for all of their work. 
And with that, I'm going to introduce investigator Elias Alberti. Uh, thank you, Sheriff. Uh, my name is Elias, Investigator Elias Alberti with the Jeffco Sheriff's Office. It's A-L-B-E-R-T-I. And I'd like everybody to uh, give a thanks to everybody for those who are attending and, and watching this conference. Um, again, as the Sheriff said earlier, uh, Peggy was found murdered on August 18th of 1963 inside the tent of her Girl Scout camp. Peggy failed to show up for breakfast and her tent mate uh, grew concerned for her and uh, went to check on her. When her tent mate uh, arrived at the tent, um, Peggy was deceased inside of the tent. <clears throat> uh, Peggy was a uh, Girl Scout counselor at the camp and she was on her uh, last night of being there. She was very excited about being a counselor for the first time at the Girl Scout camp and um, it was a tremendous loss to the tent mate and the other Girl Scouts that were there. Uh, that tent mate uh, ran for help and contacted the adults that were on staff there. There was approximately 17 adults that were uh, on staff there at the camp and uh, they called for assistance. The Jefferson County Coroner's Office arrived um, and ended up realizing that uh, after a short investigation, realized that um, Peggy had been murdered. Uh, there were marks on her necks and there were signs of a sexual assault that had occurred. The sheriff's office uh, that day in 1963 uh, aggressively followed up on this case and a lot of investigators were assigned to bring the killer to justice. They followed up on the 17 adult staffs that were there, interviewed over 105 Girl Scouts that were at the camp during that time frame along with 10 other teenage counselors. The case had been extensively worked for several years uh, in, and uh, by multiple investigators here at the Sheriff's Office. In 2007, investigators at the Sheriff's Office attend, attempted to develop uh, DNA evidence on evidences that was collected at the scene. A, due to that evidence testing, a profile, partial profile was created and entered into CODIS, where that profile still sits today. From 2007 to 2019, we were unable to get any leads due to that profile. Um, in June of 2019, we resubmitted some evidence that was left at the scene also um, to develop maybe potentially a better DNA profile. We were able to do that with the use of our Jeffco Regional Crime Lab and we were able to submit that DNA profile um, in October of 2019 to United Data Connect for the testing of an in investigative genetic genealogy in that testing. <clears throat> in October also of 2019, we were able to, um, through research and some advancements in the genetic genealogy investigation, we're able to identify um, James Raymond Taylor as a suspect. Once we were able to identify Mr. Taylor as a suspect, we were able to locate and contact immediate family members of his family. They cooperated with the investigation and were, in, were an integral part of, of assisting us to confirm um, James Taylor as the suspect in this case. We have spent several months searching for James Taylor with um, no luck. We have no idea where he's at um, and used all the means necessary, databases, uh, interviews to find James Taylor and we've been unable to locate him. James was last seen in the Las Vegas area in 1976. James Taylor does have a criminal history in 1972 and 1974 in the Las Vegas area. In March of this year, we applied for an arrest warrant for James Taylor, and that arrest warrant is valid uh, in, in the system now. And uh, I'd like to turn it back over to the sheriff. Thank you, Elias. I'm going to introduce uh, Mitch Morrissey, the former district attorney um, in Denver. 
And uh, the Paravon competitor, I've seen this guy before. Uh, spelled M O R R I S S E Y. I want to thank the sheriff for including me in this press conference. Well, he was born in 1939, so. For his commitment to solving sure. cold cases. Yeah. It's that commitment that has brought us here today. Uh, there aren't many people, there aren't many departments or investigators that uh, work on cases this old. It's my understanding that this is the oldest case in Probably like 81, history something like that. solving uh, through genetic genealogy. No other case this old has been solved. Uh, we consider it solved. We were just glad to be part of that. The sheriff engaged us in the latter part of last year, and in light of his budget cuts, I think that doing that was very important. Uh, and then we were able to actually, through getting the sequencing done and also using Joan Hanlon, whose name has been mentioned yeah, today, so said our genealogist, uh, fairly shortly uh, we were able to come up with the person of interest that we have here today and then Detective Alberti did an outstanding job when it came to confirming that. So all of those people that have been thanked, the lab, the detectives. It's amazing they stored that it really, DNA for that long. The commitment to solving cold cases here years. in Jeffco. As I listened to this, you know, my grandfather I mean, since had a business in Edgewater. I grew up in Jeffco myself. So to see this commitment and the fact that this sheriff's department here doesn't forget <clears throat> these families. And really, that's why we do this work. So I'm just proud to be part of the solution of this case. And Sheriff, thank you again for including me. And what questions might there be from any member of the media? Yep. What about the family? What do they say about it? In this, in this case, what happened, we were engaged by the Sheriff's Department. We took the sample, got it from the crime lab, and we sent it to our, um, our lab in Oklahoma that does our sequencing. They were able to get a good sequence that could then be uploaded into the two different databases that allow law enforcement to do genetic genealogy, and that's Family Tree DNA and GEDmatch. Once we did that, oh, we looked tree, at the yeah, matches bigger, that we one. got in those two databases and actually got a very good match to a close relative, and I can't tell you how close and I can't tell you who, but a close relative who then cooperated with us and gave us even further information, both about family trees that they had built, and we were able to then in fairly short order come up with this individual as the person of interest provided that then to the to the sheriff's department and detective elias then took up the w hard work that it takes to find uh, offspring to look for the individual those kinds of things. i wouldn't be surprised if but he's dead again this is the oldest suspect that's been identified through this methodology in, Colorado? in the in, no in the world in the world. Seems like the oldest case, too. Yeah, so the question, just in case some people didn't hear, is how can we connect him to Colorado? Uh, James, James Taylor was married in Colorado in, 19, in 1961. He lived in Colorado in 1961. He also um, worked at a television repair shop in Edgewater in the early 60s. So um, he also had... Um, a child that was born in Colorado in the early 60s. So we were able to track the fact that he was in Colorado during this time frame, during the early 1960s, specifically in August of 1963, and we were able to um, track his movements up to 19, 1976 in Las Vegas. Edgewater is only 39 miles from the camp. No, James Taylor does not have any connection to the Girl Scouts, the Girl Scouts that are at the camp, to the hmm. family of wow. Peggy Beck, Random. or anything like that. And you've kept all this evidence for 57, 57 years. Can you explain uh, what evidence you've kept? Um, no, so I can't go into details about what the evidence actually is. 
and just due to the reminder that it is an open and active case due to the warrant that's well, the out there is for um, James Taylor. Even though we're unable to locate him and find him, uh, there is a chance that the general public out there may know uh, James Taylor, may know his whereabouts. You know, he would be 80 years old right now, 81 at the end of this year. Um, but there might be people out there that would assist the sheriff's office in locating him. Correct. We have that evidence um, from from 1963, and the sheriff's office uh, does a, their due diligence in storing hundreds and hundreds of thousands of items of evidence yearly um, in our evidence vault. How do you know he's still alive? Uh, I do not know that he's still alive um, at this point in time. Uh, I we can't prove that he's deceased either. Uh, so with all the research and investigations that we've done. Looking for him, uh, the, the, the probability of him being deceased is, is high, uh, but we cannot actually prove that he's deceased. And since that is the case, that's why we applied right, for the then, arrest warrant. When he died, what happened to him? <laughs> if he died, yeah. You, you will be provided pictures at the end of this press conference, sir. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Let's see a picture. So um, he, I can tell you that he does have a criminal history. Um, but I can't go into detail about due to that arrest warrant being active and open. Um, but he does have a criminal history. I just can't go into detail about what it is. Huh. So were there any witnesses at this? Uh, I mean, can we go back to that actual case and maybe fill us in if there was any witnesses that heard anything? Or well, it's a late notification, Audrey, because we've been on for so there was So there was approximately 130 people at the camp when this, when this crime was occurred. She, um, there is a timeline. Uh, the people were asleep. Nobody actually heard anything that, that would have alerted them to this crime being committed or anything like that. So uh, there was multiple witnesses at the camp, but it was during the middle of the night. So there were multiple witnesses. There was multiple people at the camp. Okay. Correct. But no, witnesses. no witnesses that actually saw it take place or heard anything, no. 30 feet away was the closest tent. But well, that's close. James Taylor? He does have family that's still alive, correct? Um, I'm not going to say that. I apologize. Have you talked to them? His family? Yeah, James Taylor's family, like I mentioned earlier, uh, did assist us in this case. We needed their assistance in I mean, helping us kids, come to this conclusion, and they or? were um, helpful in assisting us with uh, where we're at today. Um, no, they don't know his whereabouts. They don't know. From the 70s. Wow. The evidence that you Yeah, so the question is, in case people didn't hear, is um, can Sounds we talk like about where the DNA evidence was located and on what items and no? Well, we already know. It's in every article. So the only picture that we have of James Taylor is extremely outdated. It's from 1961. Uh, we have been unable to locate any other pictures that newer than that. So um, wow. we are That's unable amazing. to provide any information regardless to that. We have not been able to find any information. The last bit of information that we were able to find on his whereabouts was from 1976 through some paperwork. But after 1976, we have not been able to locate any paperwork or paper trail or anything like that on, on James Taylor. Um, no, I do not know when he left Colorado exactly. You need to find people who knew him. That little technique you know, I want with to thank the mask switch for uh, isn't taking really the opportunity, and I work. know that question <laughs> came up. How can how yeah. can people help us find him? Certainly, we don't know. Um, as uh, investigator Alberti mentioned, whether James Taylor is um, dead or alive, um, or if there was a change in identity. Um, the only picture we have is is the the picture that we have. But um, along the way, there may have been conversation um, that he had had with somebody. If somebody knows. Uh, of that conversation or him or or any changes we certainly would like to know about that 
Nothing would give us uh, greater pleasure than to actually put the handcuffs on James Taylor so that he could be held accountable in a, in a court of law. Um, and obviously, um, when we, we get information like this, it is a lead. It is not the entirety of the investigation, the DNA evidence. It has to be put in the context of everything that has gone on in terms of the early investigation back in 1963 and then also what follows what the investigative team does with that. All of that has to come together and ultimately if James Taylor is arrested um, it would be up to a, a court process um, to determine um, definitively if there was guilt in that case. Um, but at this point in time we're confident that we have the suspect who is responsible for the murder of Pe Peggy Beck. Again, thank you for uh, coming out today um, and your attention to this matter. You've been listening oh, to the shit. Jefferson County Sheriff's the Office. Picture? They've announced a big break in a 56 year old. And this one never played. Ah, uh, shit. Um, and your attention to this matter. Okay, but where's the, uh, the picture? No, there we go. Come on. Pan it. I want to see the picture. You know, that technique they're doing with the mass doesn't work. Like he's breathing in the air, and then right when the other guy shows up, they take it off, so you're going into the cloud of, you know, it's just, I mean, it looks cool. Oh, it's still going on. Well, good morning, Nicole. Uh, nice to hear from you. Wow, I'm glad um, I tried that. Hi. Yep. Um, the, the question that was asked is, um, do we believe that this will help us solve other cold cases? Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we have 48 unresolved uh, cold cases. 39 of those are homicides. And wherever there is um, DNA, evidence that we might be able to obtain and ultimately develop a profile from, uh, we would like to do that. And so um, investigator Alberti is, um, he is assigned as our cold case investigator. Um, he does have some support um, and we are going back over those cases, even though they have gone. Come on, why aren't you still playing the damn thing? Early People. investigation this matter. That's lame. Um, Definitive. You know, that just shows you. Yeah. Ah, forget it. <laughs> God, I'm so frustrated not being able to see the face, but it's cool to actually get the press conference. Let me turn. Let me fix the audio before I blow your ears out here in a second. Now I've got the audio set correctly. Yeah, see what it shows you is you get these news channels that really aren't, you know, they're not really aware or care that much. They're just sort of like, oh, let's get the news, let's get the news, 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 news. Look at, look at, look at, look at, look at, look at. Okay, but they don't really know what's going on, so that's why nobody really focused in on. Oh wait, let's hurry up and let's get a shot of the uh, the suspect. I'm sure we'll see it later. It'll be posted somewhere. But uh, that's, that's what you get because they don't, they just, their minds don't work like that. They're just kind of like, next story, hurry up. All right, but anyways, we'll be back on at uh, around 7 tonight. And we'll be talking about the, uh, let's see, hold on.
We're going to do the interview with Jim in the Matthew Jed Hall case. Um, <laughs> and yes, it's it's really a Jim. Okay, it's uh, let me get this. Yeah, Jim Terry, the private investigator in that case, is coming on. He's going to go over the whole case. We're going to map it all out. And I th I'll, I'll make my own version of the surveillance footage sequence because I have all the footage. All right. So thank you guys very much. And <laughs> as I always say, everybody, until next time, be safe out there.